Welcome to the show, Brain Health Unchaining Your Pain. I am delighted and really honoured to welcome onto the show today Dr. Leo Galland, MD, who is just a phenomenal force for good in the space of integrative medicine. Well, welcome to the show, Dr. Leo. So nice to be here with you. <laughs> so for those that don't know Dr. Leo Galland, he specialises in the evaluation and treatment of patients of all ages with complex chronic disorders. He views the relationship between the doctor and the patient as a partnership that empowers people to take control of their own health. He's a pioneer in studying the impact of intestinal microbes, which is the butt microbiome, and intestinal permeability, which is leaky gut, on health and disease. He's received international recognition for developing innovative nutritional therapies to treat autoimmune, inflammatory, allergic, infectious, and gastrointestinal disorders, and has been uh, had his work described in numerous scientific articles and textbook chapters. He's graduate of Harvard University and New York University School of Medicine, board certified in internal medicine and listed in leading physicians of the world and America's top doctors. And in 2017, Dr. Gallen was awarded the Albert Nelson Marquis Lifetime Achievement Award by Marquis Who's Who. Wow. What an amazing accomplishment. And also, I'm so grateful for the for the work that you do, um, particularly in the realm of the situation that we are now in, which is COVID. And I've absolutely, um, your source of information on your website has been a powerhouse of information for myself and also um, helping my clients better understand how they can recover from COVID. But before we dive into that topic, I'd love if you could uh, describe what you are truly passionate about right now. Well, for the past two years, I've been dealing with and trying to help my patients deal with COVID-19 um, and trying to understand the nature of the virus, the human response to the virus, all of the many different aspects of this pandemic as it affects our lives um it's that's kind of been all consuming yeah i can imagine and, and it's impacted people in so many different ways depending on their genetic construct as well as their lifestyle uh um interactions that they have um with the environment and obviously how how, how they are from a, a immune system perspective what for you has been the most notable problem or biggest challenge in the context of, of COVID that we're experiencing now? Um, well, the biggest challenge has been, especially in the US, the politicization of the science. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's really been kind of, it's really been mind boggling the way that um sides have been taken mm -hmm. um and and part of my goal has always been to try and really understand the science um be flexible um certainly in, in medical practice my goal has always been to be patient-centered to try and understand what are the needs of this individual rather than what construct am i trying to impose on the individual um and and that's that has really guided what I've tried to do with in dealing with COVID-19, um, and it's been very distressing to me to see the way that that um, the science has gotten used for political purposes, mm -hmm. rather than actually focusing on helping the improve the outcome of the individual, right. which is really what we're talking about, isn't it? <laughs> Context yes, of COVID, absolutely. and and I think. You know, for me personally, I, I I came across your work. Obviously, I'm based in the UK. When I was lying in bed, um, wondering how to get myself out of the state I was in, having contracted COVID from my daughter, uh, most likely because it was picked up through nursery, and thinking, "Gosh, I think I've done everything that I possibly could from a intervention perspective myself, personally." Um, as a certified brain health professional, what am I not doing? <laughs> and how can I help myself get better? 
and I came across the, the amazing uh, summary of all the science and all the interventions that you've put on your website, um, which is like your COVID Bible of, of steps people need to take and the lovely videos that you've done uh, and watched them again and again and again um, to embed that information in, in and, and take the appropriate steps to help me recover. Um, and I, what I was really shocked, obviously, from getting COVID was how quickly it can consume you as, you know, as an individual, you think you're just getting uh, a, a little bit of energy. I started off with a muscle aches and pains and quickly uh, lost my energy completely and then subsequently developed a cough. My daughter, Lily, who's three, um, she, she didn't really present any symptoms other than having nightmares. Um, which is, could have been due to COVID itself, possibly, um, but also could be due to the um, the trauma she was witnessing of mummy being poorly in bed. Um, and I just thought, how can we? And she got a cough too. And we we dealt with it with, through the recommendations that you you put forward. And I am fully recovered in about four weeks, which was amazing. You know, I was really thankful for. So really, thank you um, from the bottom of my heart there. But what I really was shocked by was the number of people who are still struggling with COVID six months, 12 months, two years on. Um, and I know that there was a recent study that came out here in the UK about the outcome of people hasn't significantly improved um, over a two year period um, based on um, them be being hospitalised. Um, but however, there was no intervention taken by the by the medical community to facilitate the people improving their outcome. And that's what I'd really um, love to talk about today, because I know it really, you know, in terms of unchaining people's pain, we're not just talking about the pain here and now. It's such a long, slow burn that is is it being experienced both from a you know obviously yourself being incredibly busy in the in the medical space but people actually not getting better in the way that they can get better through interventions that doesn't necessarily require drug use right well some of the studies that have been been done in the UK are particularly um, alarming and also illustrate the nature of the problem we're, we're dealing with because people who have mild COVID may have persisting cognitive deficits mm -hmm. uh, that can last for months and months, one or two years. Um, there are changes in the MRIs of the brain yeah. that actually match those cognitive deficits. It's the same areas that that line up. So these are not the MRI changes. I, and I think this was a really, really important study where um, ser where um, repeat MRIs were done in people who had had COVID and who had had MRIs just before the onset of the pandemic. And there was a control group of people who didn't get COVID. And there were changes in the brain, loss of actual brain matter on mm -hmm. MRIs in the people who had had COVID. And these were not people who had been hospitalized. They hadn't been very sick. Mm -hmm. um, and then another UK study which looked at cognitive changes in people who had COVID. And there were cognitive dysfunctions and they really lined up. They matched up with the MRI changes. So these are very significant. Mm -hmm. And and there was a relationship between um, the the nerve tracts that are involved in taste and smell. So it was, it's pretty clear from uh, this set of research that the virus has access to the brain through the nose and can cause inflammation and other types of damage there um, that really impact on people's lives for mm. a long period of time. Uh, helping to restore and protect the brain in people who have acute COVID, I think really needs to be a priority. It certainly has been in my practice. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. And I think it's something that people, you know, I'm constantly coming across people who are experiencing brain fog, they're struggling with their energy levels, they can't get themselves back in focus. 
um, or, or they've got an enhanced um, level of symptoms that they previously had from a mental health perspective, such as, you know, increased um, uh, symptoms of depression, <clears throat> excuse me, which, which they didn't have before COVID. And, you know, there may be um, uh, a relationship between people catching COVID and the number of suicides that are being experienced because people who are in a depressive state go into a deep depression and that then obviously tips them into the into the final resort to to help them untain their pain which obviously is not is a permanent solution um i'm i'm really curious because i'd love to really d- dive into this brain health issue from a covid perspective for, from your standpoint from your experience in 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 the work that you do what what is optimal brain health for you personally um well okay for me personally it's the ability to think through problems. Um, And um, I would say actually, from a societal perspective, um, problem solving is what we as a species need in order to um, continue to survive and to thrive. And that means being able to to identify what the problems are, what are the obstacles, um, and then to come up with plans. Um, Certainly in terms of my medical practice, I would say that's been the approach that I've taken for decades, is to try and identify or look look for those problems that are not being solved Mm -hmm. and try to figure out, okay, is there a rational way to solve them? I mean, I remember reading an article Uh, It was actually in The Lancet, the leading British medical journal, probably 30 or 40 years ago. It was an analysis of medical education, and it it, um, maybe it was an editorial, and it said, big problem in medical school is that students are not told, taught how to solve problems. And and I I really think that is the most important um, mental quality that needs to be fostered. Uh, do you know uh, that, I love that? I can really relate to that as well because I'm a physicist by background, and so my my goal is why, 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 <laughs> and I have always defaulted to the need to understand what the problem is and solve it. And I think you know the way we sometimes approach a problem is we look for a symptom, or we we take a a symptom focus and and address the symptom but don't understand what the root cause of the problem is so doing root cause analysis which is i love what you do is you keep going <laughs> in your work yeah. until you find where where the you know where the root of the problem is it's like taking a roof and you're and, and you've got loads and loads of holes in, in in your roof and it keeps leaking there's no good patching it up if you're constantly got somebody who's going around and punching holes in the oh. roof again, you have to address the person that's making the holes in the roof <laughs> and causing it to leak, not 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 just the leak itself. Um, yeah, I the, the, actually for a house analogy, I, I felt began feeling about 40 years ago that what I was doing in working with patients was going into the basement, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and where it was very dark. Um, and where, where all the specialists that they'd seen hadn't gone, they were just tinkering with the upper floors. And so I was, I was going into the basement with a lantern and I was kind of looking around, oh, here's where, here's where the problems lie. You know, let's get down to, let's, let's get down to the foundations of things. Yeah. And I think that's so important. What is it you're really noticing in terms of, um, I know you talk about this a lot on the on your website, but you know common symptoms that people present with, um, and I know there's over fifty, but the common ones that people present with, which tends to indicate that they uh, they are experiencing long COVID, that perhaps they haven't had previously or have been have worsened. Um, well, uh, there. Almost anything could be a symptom of long COVID. And, um, and and there are also aspects of long COVID that are not even symptomatic. That is someone who's yeah. had COVID-19 has twice the risk 
of being diagnosed with diabetes or high blood pressure over the subsequent six months compared to someone, a, a matched person who has not had COVID. Um, but the particular things that I look for with my patients when I've treated them um, are, uh, is this issue of brain fog. Like, how's yeah. your brain working? How well are you able to solve problems, to think things through, to think, um, uh, to understand what's going on um, uh, that you need to address? How's your memory doing and yeah. your ability to focus? Uh, those are very important issues. And I, and I want to make sure that every patient of mine who has experienced COVID-19 is able to tell me, you know, within a month or six weeks of the infection, yeah, I feel really back to normal. My mind's working fine. Um, the second thing is, um, is physical energy, stamina, yeah. your ability to, to do the things that you used to do and that you want to do. Um, and of course, that can get hammered just by the fact that you've been in bed for a week or two. Um, I mean, if you if a person's been really sick, just cutting back, you have to build up slowly. Mm. It's the people who cannot build up slowly without crashing that really concern me, because that's one of the hallmarks of chronic fatigue. Um, uh, me, basically, is um, that you try doing things to condition yourself. And instead of getting stronger and stronger, you actually yeah, pay a, a heavy price for that. So that's something yeah. that I really look out for. Um, then there's the issue of breathlessness. Um, uh, so the question is, is, are the limitations on your activity um, related to uh, breathlessness and you know, just feeling a need for air that you're not getting? Um, then there's pain. And of course, there are emotional changes as well. And, and there it's always challenging to try and determine how much of this is the trauma of what you just went through. And, and not just you personally, but that the whole society. The is whole system through. that's been impacted. Yeah, the whole, because, yeah. because I, you know, if you, today, if you get a sore throat and a fever, uh, you know, I mean, two years ago, you got a sore throat and a fever. It was okay. Well, I got something. I'll get over it. Today, in the face of the pandemic, you get a sore throat and a fever. And it's kind of terrifying because you don't know where it's going to end. Yeah. Where, what's going to happen next? And then there's the impact of your immediate family or the wider right. system. Right. Who am I going to spread this with? to? Um, yeah. Um, and, and the isolation and the quarantines. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's very traumatic for all of us. Mm, mm. And I think what's really difficult as well is the fact that this is not a once uh, infection. People I know who've, who have had kids that have been infected twice going into three times. So it's not just this happens once and then you go through the, the recovery phase that can be enduring. Right. But it's also that you could be going through this multiple times. Yeah, absolutely. I have patients who, who have had two or three bouts of COVID and, and not even very far apart. I mean, people mm -hmm. got the Delta variant in August and then in December they got Omicron. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. one thing is that if you've had it before or if you've been vaccinated, it's going to be less severe. And, and almost yeah. everybody who's had it more than once said, oh, the second time it was so much easier than the first. Yeah, I, I love some of the, the studies that you brought up, and I particularly love the one that they they did in America with with um, medical professionals, where they studied uh, the vegetable intake before yeah, that, that, I think that's before a, COVID and after recovery. That's a really COVID. important. That's a really important study, and although the researchers were in, in the U.S., they looked at, at healthcare workers in six different countries, including yeah. the U.K. Uh, and it was a fairly large study, and, and it really used validated tools to assess the severity of infection and the, the pre-illness diet. Um, yeah. And the results were just so dramatic. Um, and, and, you know, as I've said when I've spoken about this, if this were a drug that did this, imagine the headlines. 
Yeah, I mean, he's, he's quoted a 72% reduction in the risk of developing uh, moderate to severe disease. Yeah, right. With a, with a 40% with, increase in vegetable consumption. Right. And it wasn't even a huge number of vegetables. It was people, no. it was an average of going from an average of 10 servings a week to 15 servings a week. Yeah. Um, you know, that's all it took to Which create Which is amazing. That change. Yeah. And, and I, what I find, I don't know if you're experiencing this, um, your side of the pond, but I find it amazing that people aren't, educating people more in the benefits of increasing their uptake you know at, at, at a global level or a you know a, a national level or a community level how powerful a simple uptake in your vegetable consumption and we know food is medicine yes <laughs> you know it, 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 the best form of medicine often from a preventative perspective certainly um and if we don't focus on our food and optimizing it to optimize our immune system and our, and our gut function and everything that that falls out of that um, optimization or, or absence of then then we we end up deferring a, what could be a very acute problem into a much a much bigger problem uh, over the long term as well what's even um, what really is um, really disturbing to me is the way that the mainstream media has actively worked to discredit the idea that anything you yourself do can protect you against COVID. Mm. Um, it is it, uh, so that, you know, vitamin D, for example, so really has been shown to have protective effects, yet article after article in the mainstream media will say, oh, you know, vitamin D doesn't really protect you against COVID. Don't think you're not going to get sick if you take vitamin D. And there is this attitude that the only thing that is going to save you from COVID is what the doctors do to you. Mm. And that there's nothing you can do yourself that is going to make, that is going to help you. And um and almost the converse is true <laughs> yeah, there are yeah, so many things that we there, can do at an individual level that will that have the opportunity to improve our outcome and actually um you know yes taking uh the the um vi uh, and antiviral drugs that are necessary the vaccinations um, are really important, but they don't stop you from getting it. Um, and they certainly um, are not going to stop you from um, developing long COVID either. Uh, right. It, it's, uh, there clearly is value to the, to the vaccines mm -hmm. in that they allow huge numbers of people to develop an immune memory of this virus without having to go through the infection itself. Yeah. And, and uh, the benefits of that, I think, from a societal perspective and an individual perspective, have been very clear. Uh, on the other hand, as you pointed out, it's not stopping the transmission of the virus. And, uh, and there is so much more to be done than simply vaccinating and separating, you know, yeah. and to stay away from everyone and we not vaccinate. That's it, not gonna... So we have to learn to live with it. Yes, and, and that involves self-care yeah. and understanding what it takes, um, how, how, you, how you can maintain your health in the face of threats like this. Mm. And, and I know that you go through this five-phase approach. Would you mind kind of outlining, um, and I will put the link to, to your COVID handbook on, uh, on the show notes. Would you mind outlining the sort of five-phase approach that is really important for people right. to take? Well, okay, well, it's constantly evolving, first of all. So I don't <laughs> even know if they're really five phases right okay. now. You know, it's not, it's not really formulaic. But, um, but the first principle for me is understanding that um, the way, one of the ways in which this virus makes you sick is that it enters your cells by binding to a receptor um, which happens to be a vitally important enzyme called ACE2. ACE2. I like to uh, think of this as the key in the lock to your cells. So it yeah, basically right. 
makes itself look like the uh, the key and the lock is 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 ace two and as soon as it goes in it destroys the door into your cell and everything associated in inside it like you it, it, it breaches the castle walls but goes through the front door uh, right and and so the loss of ace two because of the virus mm -hmm. is one of the important factors in creating not only the complications of acute infection but also long covid so the foundation for everything that i've done in trying to help people uh, confront COVID-19 is to strengthen and support the activity of ACE2. And that's true whether you're trying to prevent serious infection, treat infection when it occurs, and certainly important when dealing with long COVID. Mm -hmm. Because there are studies that have shown that even relatively healthy people who have recovered from COVID-19 have deficits in the functions that ACE2 regulates, if you know how to look for them and measure them. Mm -hmm. Problems in circulatory function in healthy young adults. Um, so I want to restore ACE2 activity. And, there and are ways it there can be treated as well, can't it? De obviously, depending on your lifestyle, depending on existing conditions you had, one of the things that you mentioned was asthma. <clears throat> Already have a depletion, people suffering with asthma um, already have a depletion of ACE2, is that right? That's correct. That and and actually, having asthma is one of the leading risk factors for long COVID. Uh, in a recent study, uh, people with asthma had um, a nine-fold increase in the risk of developing long COVID. And I think it's because they start out with ACE2 that's compromised to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, so... There are um, lifestyle and dietary and nutritional measures that can enhance ACE2 activity. Uh, certainly diet has an impact, especially um, the foods that are rich in, um, in polyphenols and bioflavonoids enhance so ACE2 activity. Curcumin, resveratrol, yeah. taking the supplements. Vitamin D is very important there. So I start with that. As a, as a foundation, let's help to bring back ACE2. Now, yeah. damage to ACE2 has been shown by research that was done at the Scripps Institute in the US to result in stress to mitochondria. Mitochondria are the powerhouses that generate um, energy for cells. And so the next layer is to support mitochondrial function. And there are no drugs that do that. There no, are some which I supplements. Think is so important that people realise that there is the drugs are not available, and it's supplementation and appropriate dietary intervention and lifestyle intervention that restores your energy powerhouses in your cells. And and I'm assuming that the the energy depletion that people experience is is a is a consequence of your mitochondria not having the powerhouse uh um, functioning fully sorry. is that's okay is that is that um is that right from a yeah oh yeah definitely and, so and there are specific have, there are so specific I was say, nutritional if people are feeling really depleted energetically it's because their mitochondria have been compromised and so really they need to focus on the steps that are necessary to enhance their mitochondrial function and restore the energy powerhouses in their cells mitochondria play an important role not only in physical energy but in brain energy mm. and in the immune and the energy of the immune system you know the the cells of the immune system require a lot of energy to function well um, so that mitochondrial support is important for immune function brain function and physical energy and stamina mm. uh, so so that that's a that's a, a second layer um, to the foundation is mitochondrial support. Coenzyme Q10, carnitine uh, are helpful as supplements. And carnitine also supports the function and development of the energy lymphocytes that are necessary for remembering how you fight this virus. 
which is really important too so your soldiers that are you know that know how to fight the fight <laughs> you want to make sure that they're equipped with the you know with the ipads or the memory system so that they know how to do it again and again yes right right so 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 those are two things that are really fundamental um and then there are um many different physiologic functions that are thrown awry by the loss of ACE2 and the impairment of mitochondrial function. And I'm working on a diagram that I call the web of long COVID because um, from the center where, there, where you have these, the ACE2 and mitochondrial dysfunction, there are all these um, filaments Launches. that go out and they all interconnect with one another. Yeah. Um, and they impact circulatory function and blood clotting um and and various aspects of immune function and, and there's more and more research showing you know different research labs will they'll look at this and they'll look at that aspect um but not the integrated right and so what i try to do is to look at how all of these things are related to one another and, and therefore and what can you do about it what i find fascinating about the work you do with all, all of your background experience in immune system and immune uh, system function is the importance of optimizing our gut health to restore our immune system and the fact that the virus can really stay in our guts beyond us actually uh, recovering, uh, you know, it, it, removing it from our system uh, outside our gut, as, as you will. So we may not experience the, uh, the sort of immediate symptoms, but actually that that virus staying in our gut can contribute to to the long covid symptoms that we experience right right we we don't at this point know if persistence of the virus in the gi tract as opposed to other places mm -hmm. plays an important role um in long covid there is a fair amount of research indicating that at least for some people with long covid viral persistence is a factor uh, and the virus has been found in all in so in organs all over the body. Mm -hmm. um, the but we do know that it persists in the GI tract after it leaves the respiratory tract, and we do know that that there are major disturbances in the microbiome in the GI tract, um, in the mouth, and. In um, the in the stool, as measured in, yeah, in the stool specimens, <laughs> um, even in the nose, that uh, play an important role with COVID. Uh, before the pandemic, a lot of my focus was on the impact of the gut microbiome on inflammatory disorders, immune function, brain function, um, health in general, um, and that actually has wound up being very relevant. Um, mm -hmm. to the problem of COVID-19 and of long COVID. There are distinct patterns of gut microbes that are associated with protection or, or an aggravation of the conditions. Which I don't think is really brought to the fore as much as it needs to be from a how can we help people from an integrated perspective, not just look at the fact that we need to address the uh, the immediacy of the fact that there's a virus in your system, but address the fact that how can we help the different systems in our body effectively recover and what steps can we take from an integrated standpoint to, to boost our overall function. And I think the gut, you know, often... Uh, people forget that the, there's a gut-brain uh, connection um, through the vagus nerve. So it's absolutely vital if we want to restore brain function that we also focus on how can we uh, restore our gut function and our, uh, you know, our gut microbiome um, and, in, and, and optimise that so that we are uh, best placed to facilitate uh, improvement in our brain health as well. Right. I think there are actually probably four different levels in which the gut microbiome impacts on COVID-19. The first is that the severity of infection when you get infected is influenced by what's growing in your GI tract and in your mouth as well. And that's been, that's been studied. There are anti-inflammatory bacteria 
that appear to be protective. Um, the second is the um, is the potential use of probiotics and prebiotics for actually treating the infection. And there's a randomized clinical trial from Spain that used a particular probiotic formula and showed a really significant impact on the outcome of acute infection. The third is the influence of gut microbes on the persistence of symptoms and the development of um, symptoms consistent with long COVID. And uh, this has been established both for gut, back, for gut bacteria and also for oral bacteria. And it, and it seems to be very much the same pattern. It's the, it's, are these bacteria um, organisms that tend to create an inflammatory state in the body or that tend to turn down inflammation? And then the fourth use is in actually treating the symptoms of long COVID. Um, and that makes sense for the GI symptoms, but there's a definite impact on the brain as well. Mm -hmm. And it even goes beyond the, the vagus nerve. Um, gut bacteria produce metabolic end products called short chain fatty acids that impact brain health. And one of these, the, probably the most important butyrate actually has been shown to help the brain recover from injury. It's anti-inflammatory, not only in the GI tract, but systemically. It is volatile. It gets readily into the brain. It stimulates um, the formation of a protective factor called a BDNF, which helps the brain um, repair damaged okay, neurons. Yeah. And how can people, what steps can people actually take themselves personally to help boost their their the gut microbiome in the context of of contracting COVID. What what are the sort of simple interventions people themselves can take um, to to help enhance their gut microbiome? Okay. okay. Well, first of all, there's diet, mm -hmm. and um, a diet that is high in vegetables and high in fiber um, that helps support the growth of the kind of bacteria that we want. Um, in addition, herbs and spices, um, colorful fruits and vegetables that are rich in bioflavonoids. The flavonoids act are kind of, I view them as curating the microbiome and they guide the growth of the organ of specific organisms and types of organisms that we want. And these organisms actually alter, enhance the bioavailability of these flavonoids into our bodies. Um, then there are probiotic supplements, mm -hmm. and there I don't think that there's any one probiotic that's I ideal for everybody. Mm -hmm. There actually is a pattern of probiotics uh, that I recommend for prevention, treatment, and recovery, and they're different at different stages. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't want to go into the details that's because fine. they may not be available mm -hmm. in the UK, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are prebiotics. And I think that prebiotics, uh, especially um, galacto-oligosaccharides, mm -hmm. which are present in human milk, um, but are also available as supplements, uh, mm -hmm. play a very important role as prebiotics. And you can get, um, there's a prebiotic that you can get that, that contains that is available globally. And I'm happy to put the link, link to yeah. that. That's derived yeah, I think it's an milk. excellent. I think that's an excellent source. Yeah. Um, and, and also, I, I think it's important to use caution with antibiotics. Um, oh, yes. And I think that, that there has been, um, in certain circles, an excessive use of antibiotics in attempting to treat COVID-19. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I like to really target the use of antibiotics uh, at organisms that I know are going to respond to antibiotics and not just and, use them in a broad way when somebody has a viral infection. And the risk, of course, with antibiotics is it's it can wipe out the good bugs in your gut, as well as the the you know the bugs that, that may be seeking to to treat, which actually can be detrimental potentially over the long term. Um, and it takes a long time for people to restore their gut health. Certainly from my experience with my daughter Lily, who was born by C-section um she she was on antibiotics um early on in her life because she kept on 
getting um, chest infections and actually we moved to probiotics for her and she hasn't had uh, a problem with that since um, putting her on a on a, a, a prebiotic sorry uh, for her um, to help boost her immune immune system and gut gut function because obviously she wasn't bathed in all the all the bugs that you normally would through through a vaginal birth which helps you uh, build your immune system are you are you noticing um uh that that there is a difference in terms of people who contract it or the a greater severity depending on uh on their history um in terms of uh treatment or or coughs or colds or flu that people are more vulnerable to to contracting covid um it's hard to say about vulnerability of contracting it because right mm -hmm. now with Omicron, it, Anybody. I mean, everybody's everybody's getting it. This is so highly transmissible. Yeah. Um, the um, in terms of severity, uh, definitely underlying health problems impact on the severity of the illness, um, and aside from the ones that have been established, you know, like obesity. Um, diabetes, hypertension um, are major risk factors for more severe disease. Um, the, the, in my practice, I have a very um, specific group of problems that people bring come to me with. They're mostly immune problems, autoimmune disorders, chronic infections, um, allergies. And so many of those um, individuals are prone to the complications that can occur with COVID-19. Um, and I view my role as to try and help them not only get over the acute infection as quickly as possible, but to prevent the aggravation of their underlying problems by the inflammation that occurs. Yeah, and I think that's so important. I'd love to just dive quickly. I know we're, we're a bit short of time, but I'd love to dive quickly into children uh, and helping children from a, a recovery perspective with COVID because a lot of the focus has been on on adults and ad adult interventions but what what would your advice be to parents who have children who are really struggling with COVID from a health perspective uh, or, or I mean we haven't even talked about it but from a psychological perspective is, is a huge problem. Um. Yeah, I think from a psychological perspective, it, it really depends on the age of the child as to how they're likely to be impacted. Um, and um, and I, I think the children just have to understand that people get sick, people get well, that's part of life. Um, uh, I think you can encourage children to um, be willing to um, take care, to eat well um, and take medication in the form of natural products mm -hmm. um, and I, I know as a way of, me, of staying, being strong and healthy. Yeah, I know for me personally, our big focus when Lily had COVID was to make sure she, we gave her as many vegetables as possible. Uh, and and obviously a multiple coloured fruit and veg to to boost her system, but also we we added um, vitamin D, omega three, and a multivitamin supplement, yeah. um, right. which which was enough. But I know you mentioned when we first connected is is perhaps zinc um, could be another and vitamin C, but at the right dose that's appropriate for your right. child's age. A lot of kids need zinc because they need, you need zinc for growth and mm -hmm. uh, many of the diets are not adequate in zinc. Mm. Um, so, and, and there are liquid zinc preparations that are quite palatable and, and easy to include. Uh, Omega-3s have been shown to be beneficial and decrease the inflammation. Um, it's, uh, I give a lot of the children a, a that I treated a uh, mix a liposomal liquid of curcumin and resveratrol, which is um, tastes pretty good and is 
easy to get compliance with. Oh, that's um, great. I didn't have the I didn't manage to get her to be compliant with taking any term right. but, but, but I think as, children <laughs> as young as two years old can understand that um that eating if you eat these foods that are healthy foods, that you'll be strong. They understand yeah. strength. Oh yeah, I'll be strong. I'll be able to run. Yeah, um, and I tell my daughter swim. I want to build your immune system soldiers and make them strong so they can fight right. fight the infection. So you're right, they do get right. it. Yeah, what they, they understand of, strength. What would That's your right. one piece of advice be for uh, anyone who's really struggling with long COVID? What would your advice be for them? Um, well, first of all, rest seems to be important. So um, start by making sure you have enough rest. Physical rest, mental rest, and sleep. Uh, mm. That really is, um, that's critical. If you don't do that, it's gonna be very hard to get anywhere um, with all of the, the, the medications, the supplements, and the other treatment approaches. Mm. And I think that's so, <clears throat> so important because that's the foundation piece for me is the most important thing from a brain health perspective is you have to optimize your sleep. Because if you haven't got that foundation there, it doesn't matter what else you do. Your right. brain isn't isn't fully functioning uh, to be able to to take on the day. How can I, I, how can we get hold of you, Dr. Leo Galland, to people to find out more? We'll post all of the information in the notes. Okay. But what's the best way? Uh, well, I have a website drgallon.com that's d-r-g-a-l-l-a-n-d.com where i post um information and i've put up um some videos on vimeo and youtube uh about long covid um uh, your brain after long covid healing long covid understanding long covid i'll continue to be posting that information uh, this is such a fast moving area um, that you put something up one month and a month later, there's a, there's more information. It's not that, that what you've already put out there has become obsolete. It's just that there's new inflammation and information that expands, deepens and broadens the, un, the vision. Yeah. And, and I, I just really appreciate you for doing that work and taking the time to dig into the research and bring to the fore what people need to be reading and learning and implementing um, at, at a medical professional perspective and also an individual perspective to help people really take back control of, of their well-being and, 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 and facilitate their recovery from COVID. And I know that your two books that I have, have here, which is the um, fat resistant diet and also super immunity for kids have been absolutely brilliant Bibles for, for me as a parent to, to make sure that I can do everything uh, appropriate to support my daughter's um, health and well-being and optimize her immune system. So just thank you um, from the bottom of my heart in all that you do. Uh, and thank you for your time being on the show. Okay, well, thanks for giving me the opportunity to share my experience with your viewers. You're most welcome. And I look forward to connecting with you in the future. Okay, absolutely. Brought to you by Winject Studios. We are an all-in-one educational platform for podcasters that revolutionizes how hosts leverage content to increase engagement with listeners, downloads, and income. We come together to focus on community, collaboration, and collective impact. For more information on how you can interact directly with our hosts, access exclusive live content with offers you can't get anywhere else from our official partners, join our purpose-driven community by visiting www.winject.com. If you're ready to build a career doing what you love, then we're ready to see you there.